everyone. I'm Sharon, one of the reference librarians here at the library, and I'm really happy that you're all here this afternoon. I've got a few announcements before I introduce our special guest, Lynn Wood. Um, if you haven't registered already, please be sure and sign up for the final program in this year's series, which is Home Safety, and that will be on Tuesday, September 26th. Um, we also have a caregiver support group at the library that meets in the Learning Center on the second floor, the second Friday of each month. And our next meeting will be Friday, September 8th. Uh, there's no registration required for that. You just come when you can. So today's pre uh, presenter, Lynn Wood, has spent uh, the past 20 years working in assisted living memory care settings, assisting older adults and their families experiencing life after an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. She's passionate about her work with families during this emotional time in their lives when they're trying to make urgent, long-term uh, care decisions for a loved one. In October 2018, she joined Mental Health America of the Mid-South as a caregiver uh, support coordinator. She's a certified dementia specialist with positive approach to care and a member of the National Council of Certified Dementia Practitioners. Although Lynn loves presenting to the community, her focus is meeting one-on-one -on -one with families and caring for the caregiver. We're thrilled to have her with us today. Please welcome Lynn Wood. I've only been wandering around up here while everybody's been coming in, so it was no great surprise, but I'm always fascinated at how great I sound on paper. When people are reading my bio, it's like, man, who is that person? Oh, wait, that's me. So, so I am ecstatic to be here. Um, Mental Health America is an um, agency here. We're a nonprofit, and we serve 13 counties, with Williamson County being one of them. And my program is one of only two uh, that we know of in the state where I work for the caregiver. Lots of people are out there dealing and, want, and working with the person who has the diagnosis and trying to fix that. I am here to support caregivers and trying to navigate the journey, what's going to happen next. Let's prepare and plan and put um, things in place and let's hope we never need them. But um, so if you uh, uh, need anything like that, my services are completely free. And I'd be happy to even stay after this if there's any questions about that. So I have to get my plug in there every once in a while or my marketing person's not going to be happy with me. So I have to get that in here. So, so today we're going to talk about uh, navigating communication and behaviors with someone who has a dementia or an Alzheimer's diagnosis. You know, it can get really hard to communicate with someone and because they're... Um, cognitive uh, cognition is declining, right? So we have to adjust to meet their needs where they are. Um, it's easy for me to say that, but not so easy when you're in the midst of trying to convince someone not to throw fried chicken across the room, right? Or the doctor says, start taking this medicine, and you're like, yeah, I can't even get him to drink a glass of water. How am I going to get new medications in him, right? So that's part of my job, then, is to help with families to navigate um, what the doctor wants you to do, but it's also to take care of you as caregiver stress. Uh, make sure your own primary care doctors, if you are a caregiver, know that you're a caregiver. Because if you start losing weight or if your hair starts coming out or your toenails start turning yellow, your doctor needs to be aware that you're a, a caregiver so he, he or she can support you. Um, and that, um, it's really important. My dad's a caregiver for my mom. So uh, my job is to keep him healthy uh, so I don't have to take care of two people because I'm selfish and I've already told them that. So that's no surprise if y'all know my mom and daddy. They'll be all right with me saying that. Um, so we're going to talk about language in the brain today, some communication do's and don'ts. Um, that is going to be a handout that I will send to um, our illustrious leader back there. And so you can print, that, uh, print those out at will um, or email her and she can send you some copies of those um, when you see them. Uh, some audio changes and visual changes. What's really happening in the brain? You know, we have a part of the brain where our language and our cognition starts shrinking. Um, so... 
uh, that's why we can't remember things. But ironically, our hearing uh, doesn't have a real significant change due to dementia. There might be changes for another reason. But what do we do generally? Somebody will bend down and get in somebody's face and then yell at them. Do you remember who I am? Right? And so I've, been, I've done that. And I've had um, a, a very wonderful um, older adult look at me and go, I don't know what you're saying, but I am not deaf. So please stop hollering at me. And I'm like, oh, all right, Miss Etta, you're right. I'm sorry, that is my mistake. So how do we communicate? And learning what happens in the brain uh, just can help us prepare for the changes that we have to make with Alzheimer's and with our communication. Um, and the, then if we can communicate better, then we can use those for redirection techniques if we do see that behavior, right? Because we have to know how to communicate with them in order to get them to not throw fried chicken across the kitchen. So it kind of all ties in. So um, we know that Alzheimer's is a dementia. Alzheimer's type dementia it is the most prevalent form that we have, but there are 85 to 95 different reasons why someone might have cognitive change, a dementia start to happen. So, but what is really happening is they're losing the ability to understand what we're saying and they're losing the ability to communicate with us effectively. So we have to adjust ourselves and that goes into behaviors as well. Are we in the right frame of mind to be able to work with someone who has Alzheimer's or dementia? Um, Alzheimer's is actually named after Dr. Alzheimer's. He started studying a lady in 1906. If you want to research, I research weird stuff like that, but um, I'm in mental health, so that's what we do. And so he really brought Alzheimer's uh, to the forefront um, in noticing a decline in a, in a woman and really worked with that. And then in 1984 is when we, we really started looking at it and trying to figure it out. So that's a long time that we've been trying to figure out this beast called Alzheimer's. So hopefully, I hope I'm out of a job one day. That would be great if I was to get a call and there was a cure and I just could retire because my husband won't let me retire. But if there's no more Alzheimer's, then he didn't get a vote, right? So what changes in the brain? We lose a filter, right? They just say whatever they want to say. Our loved ones say whatever they want to say. The filter breaks down what the person may say or what they do, and it, just whatever comes to mind. That's why we lose judgment. We lose um, uh, responses. We're, we're just fly off the handle. That's why somebody just walks out and walks out the door because they lose that judgment part. Um, in communication, we have two different lobes of our brain. The left lobe is language, LL. That's where our nouns and our adverbs and our pronouns and all of that is and where we have that communication. On the right is rhythm. That's our prayer, poetry, um, songs. How many of us know somebody who can't carry on a really good conversation, but if you have to sing happy birthday to somebody, they can sing every word, right? Um, a preacher who might not be able to find a scripture in the Bible, but if you ask him to uh, uh, dismiss the congregation at the end of church, he would still be able to do that because that is long term and that's held on this side. Um, unfortunately, what's also on um, the right side is swear words, derogatory statements, uh, prejudicial statements. And so part of my job in working with caregivers is saying, okay, Mima might have never said a cuss word in their life and now she's cussing like a sailor. That's just because that's what she remembers. And what someone is trying to do is they're inserting a cuss word as a noun. So, you know, it's not really just cussing. It's trying to say, okay, I can't remember what this is. So now this is a beep, right? So um, keep that in, in mind. Um, we have familiar words. Um, this could be a pencil or this could be a crayon or it could be a piece of chalk or it could be an ink pen or a marker, whatever. And as a caregiver, um, let's let our loved ones be successful. Um, it still writes, all of them write. So when someone's saying, hand me that pencil, and there's a pen laying there, um, you know, hand them whatever's there because they want to write. And so that's what's happening in the brain. As the brain is shrinking, 
And that's really what's happening with a brain who has Alzheimer's or dementia. The brain lobes are really tight. And then as we, the disease takes hold, uh, the brain starts shrinking and all the lobes start uh, having gaps. So it's harder for everything to connect. And that's why we make up words or the brain tries to fix it. We um, might revert back to native language. If there's someone in, I had a family one time who was um, Filipino family and uh, the wife had di uh, was diagnosed and she started uh, going back and mixing her Filipino language and English language. And then uh, towards the end, it was all Filipino language, which was great. Her husband knew that. What was not great is they never taught their kids the native language. So now you have kids trying to take care of a parent and they're not really communicating. So we had to, we had to really work on that challenge. But so keep that in mind if you are, are interacting or caring for someone who is dual language. If English is their second language, they, if they start reverting back, that's just part of it. That um, language skills is held in our long-term memory. So it's held on for years and years and years. Um, that's why um, new stuff is forgotten because the brain has shrunk and there's nothing for those new memories to hold on to, which is why we have now short-term memory. And another thing was um, you might find uh, that changes with our communication is um, they'll start using gestures. And that's a good way for you to communicate with someone as well. It's time to eat or it's time to go. You know, it's cold outside, let's put on a coat. Um, are you hungry? I, I wanna eat, rub your tummy. Some of those things can help with um, expressing to somebody um, what you want them to do if they're not picking it up by this. And what we do as caregivers, a lot of times is we talk too much. We give too many instructions, too many details. We really make it sound grandiose and add all of the, the fluff and, and stuff to it. And really all we want them to do is put on the shoes. But what we say is, if you'll go upstairs and put on some socks and put your shoes on, then we'll be ready to go to the doctors and we won't be late. And the person who is standing there is going, socks, I remember socks and they come down with socks on and they're very proud and you're like, what? Right? So one step at a time. They don't need to know all the whys. The basics of communication is what do you want them to do? I want you to eat, bam. Not what do you want to eat? Or I'm gonna put this right down here on the table and why don't you come and sit down and we'll have dinner. That sounds great, but you want them to eat, right? So um, we have to adjust ourselves because at the end, um, we have the cognitive ability to change. That person who is living with Alzheimer's or a dementia diagnosis, any kind of dementia for whatever reason, doesn't have that ability to adjust to us. So we have to adjust to them, okay? So the brain is trying to make up information to plug in holes. And that's where we might have fibbing, we might have those cuss words. Um, you know, listen to the stories that your caregivers, I used to get so upset, my dad, my dad has a, I love my dad. My dad has a story for everything. And we were out on the Pacific Ocean on a cruise and I thought there's no way he can embarrass me here. Oh no, he found somebody that he knew or he thought he went to high school with or whatever way back in the dark ages and then there I am, you know, embarrassed all over again hearing some same stories that I've already heard. But now as an adult, and what I ask you to do is listen to the stories. Is the beginning, the middle, and the end the same as they've always been? We might have the beginning the same and the end might be the same, but the middle might just change every single time they tell it. Let's not correct them, right? Because they're telling the story and if they got the start and they got the finish and you know how the bologna was made, we know it. We don't care how it was done. I, my dad went on a fishing trip and he said, you know, I was talking to, we'll call him Sonny. Um, he told us how he wrecked the boat and he told that story eight different times. And the beginning was the end, the middle was the end, but the middle messed up every time. I'm really not sure how he wrecked his boat. And I said, well, at the bottom end is, he doesn't need to be driving and now the boat doesn't work. 
So everything is good, right? And he said to me, my dad, he said, um, are all my stories always the same? And I said, actually, daddy, they are. And I am actually listening uh, because that is a cue as to we might be moving on into a different stage of this process, this, of this dying brain that we have. So listen to those stories. Um, and um, if they get stuff wrong, it, you're gonna have to let it go. Has anybody said to you already, you're not gonna win an argument, so don't try? Yeah, you're, you're not gonna win. And at the end of the day, you just have an explosion and it's all about self-preservation, self self-preservation, right? So what can we do? to communicate with someone and not lose our minds. Well, there's some steps that we can take with that, and they're pretty simple, but I know you're in the middle of this caregiving journey, and it's gonna be, um, might be hard to think about them every once in a while. But we want to set a positive mood when we're interacting. What does our language and our body language say? Somebody who is co uh, cognitively declining, um, they are uh, losing vision uh, and they're losing that cognitive recognition. So you gotta get right in front of somebody, but what is your face saying? Because out of the five senses that we learn and learn data, vision is the most prominent, prominent one. So they're looking at you to see, should I be happy? Should I be sad? It, was there a joke told so I need to laugh? Um, am I scrunchy faced? Am I fiddling with my watch? Am I nervous? That your loved one uh, is more likely to um, exhibit the same um, facial expression that you're giving them. So when you go to do that care for someone, how are we looking? Are we relaxed? Are we smiling? We love this person and we're gonna try to do our best for this person. And then that's how they will behave because they're taking data in visually because that's just, it lasts, it gets distorted, but it lasts a long time, that vision does. You wanna get the person's attention when you wanna communicate a task to somebody. So it might be that you have to turn off the radio, turn down the television, close a window, uh, or close the curtain, something like that. What's going on in the broken brain is um, all of us in this room uh, can probably compartmentalize. So push yourself in church. If you didn't go to church, then put yourself in Walmart. Um, and, <laughs> sorry, because um, uh, I've asked somebody to call me out on that one time. They were like, what if I didn't go to church? I was like, well, we'll talk about your soul in a little bit, but right now let's talk about dementia. So, um, but when we go into Walmart or Target or to church, you got somebody greeting you, they're handing you flyers or a bulletin, the organist might be playing, the people are greeting and trying to make lunch plans before church has even started, the teenagers are coming in and talking to each other and the kids are getting their coloring books and unwrapping all the candy and things like that, right? We can compartmentalize all that. We can shut that stuff off and only listen to the person we're gonna have lunch with. And all that other stuff is just noise. Someone whose brain is dying because of Alzheimer's or, a, or a, a different type of dementia, they lose that ability to compartmentalize. So they hear all of it at the same time. That's why we have folks who don't wanna go to Walmart anymore because they don't like it. Well, they just can't comprehend all the lights and all the stimuli. Or maybe they don't wanna go to church anymore or they don't wanna go to Cracker Barrel. I hate Cracker Barrel, I don't ever wanna go to Cracker Barrel, the food is horrible. That is just not true. But there's so much going on. So that's why the second one here about getting the person's attention um, is important and we want to approach from the front when we're getting somebody's attention. Because they are looking at you but they lose peripheral vision. So when you walk up behind somebody and they swing around, who's at fault? They're just trying to protect themselves and you startled them. So when we have communication with somebody, we wanna walk in front of somebody and make sure that they are, we're getting their eye contact. And that's very important. And we want to stop all those outside distractions. Uh, it's gonna make our communication with that person a lot easier. I'm gonna go back to it. State your message clearly, simple words. And the other thing to do is if you're gonna give a instruction, um, put your socks on, 
My suggestion would be, um, if they don't do it the first time, repeat it three times is what we ask, is what we in, in, the, in this profession suggest. But what I, can't, what I don't want you to do is to change your verbiage. So if you have said, go put your socks on, and you wait a second, go put your socks on, and you wait a second, go put your socks on, because that slow brain is trying to process, and they might just get, they might get put your socks on, but it might take three different times to hear all those words. What we tend to do is go put your socks on. If you hurry up and put your socks on, we'll be ready to go. How come your socks on aren't yet? Go ahead and put those on. I've said the same thing, but I've added extra words in there, and now their brain is trying to go, wait, hold on. What's all this other stuff I'm supposed to be doing? So let's state our message clearly. We don't need a lot of fluff. Use the same words and repeat at least three times and use some, I use a little break in there. Now, if that doesn't work, you might change your verbiage then, or then maybe you have to hold up the socks and get them to see what you want them to do, right? Give them a visual clue. And let's ask one question at a time. They get confused. We might have to use visual prompts. What we say is give somebody choices. Everybody likes choices. And in your loved one or if you're a professional caregiver, you can give that person a choice. It's not what do you want to eat, but I'm making lunch. Do you want tuna fish or grilled cheese? Now you've set that person up to be successful. You're not going to offer to cook them something that you don't have cheese. So you wouldn't offer to make them a grilled cheese. That's setting, that's setting you up for an issue, right? So um, do you want to wear your blue shirt or your yellow shirt? Give that person a choice. What we have a lot of times is, what do you want to eat? I don't care. Whatever you say is fine. But that person's brain may not be able to tell, is it hot outside, so I need a salad? Or is it cold, so I need soup? Is it breakfast, so I want eggs? Or is it Christmas, so I want a ham? It doesn't know. I had a family one time, Alicia, and she called me and she said, I just wanted to tell you that I got up and I asked mama what she wanted to eat. And she said, turkey and dressing and cranberry sauce and cornbread and pinto beans and uh, pecan pie. And I said to her, uh, mama, it's, uh, it's August. We can't have Thanksgiving dinner. And I said, well, what did you learn, Alicia? And she said, I learned that if you're going to offer to cook them whatever they want, you need to have a turkey in the house at all times. <laughs> she said, that was a fight. And I did not win that argument, but I did was able to distract her and not have to have turkey and dressing and cranberry sauce for breakfast. So offer choices. And you can do the same thing when you go out to eat. Some of you in here may not want to take your loved one out to eat because they, they don't know what they want to eat. But you can feed them hints. You know, oh, this is our favorite pizza place. Bam, pizza. Do you want cheese or pepperoni, right? Or maybe you do know. And you can say, I know you love pepperoni pizza or you love Supreme. So, you know, we should get a large, right? And have them, that's the way you can communicate with them. We want to give our folks living with this horrible disease some hints. So it can pull out some things from the brain that's still there so that they can be successful. And we can treat them as an adult with dignity and respect uh, because we should and because we can. We just have to do a little bit of extra work. And as caregivers, it's hard. I know it's hard. But um, there are tools out there to help you. And I have tools. And there are tools here at the library. And uh, wonderful books over there. I've, I've done some book reviews on some of those books. Um, so there is a, a lot of resources to help you um, navigate this journey called caregiving. You have to listen with your eyes and your ears and your heart. At the end of the day, this is someone who you love. Um, you're not supposed to know this stuff. We don't learn to be caregivers until we are caregivers. We don't learn about Alzheimer's until there's in somebody in our life with Alzheimer's. Um, what I would challenge you guys to do is when your journey is over, um, can you be a resource to someone else? Can you become a facilitator at a support group? 
Can you then volunteer for the Tennessee Respite Coalition to give another caregiver a break? What, what are those avenues out there that you can take the knowledge that you have and be a support person for someone else? Um, and hopefully someone was a support person for you. And if you don't have a support person, then please call me because I will be your support person. Break down the activities. You're watching, you're listening, you're breaking down the activities. And when the going gets tough, we just have to distract them. If they're just not cooperating, let's take a step back, take a deep breath, and then we can try a different approach. We have to connect with that person before we just redirect. We just can't say, just go on into the other room and I'll be there soon. That's not, that's not redirecting. That's, that's ignoring. And what we really need to do is get them to do what we want them to do or what we need them to do. And we can pick up on some of their um, uh, wants and needs just by watching them and listening to what they're saying, but with our whole person, with our whole person is very important. We can respond with affection and reassurance. You know, at a certain time, in a certain um, timeline with the dementia or with an Alzheimer's dementia, your, your loved one or whoever you're caring for probably knew something was happening. They, they knew they weren't handling everything just quite right. Things just weren't making a lot of sense. And they got angry because they could know what this was for and now they don't. Or they can't figure out how to open the book because to them it's a book. To us it's a notepad. But then they just throw it because they don't know what they're doing. And we see those anger outbursts. We see that behavior start escalating because internally they just know that they're not the way they were before. Um, that anger doesn't typically hang around really long. Um, once they move on through, the good news is it doesn't hang around very long. The bad news is that just means we've progressed into a different stage. We've just added some more uh, decline on our journey. We don't want to say the word remember, but we do want to remember what we can. We do want to get them talking. And that is a great way to, um, to get somebody um, involved in something besides trying to help you um, unload the dishwasher. Let's get them on a task. Let's get them talking about something that they can communicate and talk to us about because the broken brain can't do a lot of things at one time. And so if the brain is focused on telling the story of how they didn't wear any clothes underneath the robe at the graduation when they graduated high school, ha, 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 then they're not thinking about how can I help you cook dinner and put their hands all over everything. Let's give the brain something that they can be successful at. That's when we use activities, stories, music, things of that nature. And so you use the phrase, tell me about it. Not don't you, do you remember? But did you ever, or tell me about the time when, if you're taking care of a family member, then I know that my dad almost got stepped on by a donkey when he was eight. Right? So now I can say, tell me about the time you almost got stepped on by a donkey when you were eight. Oh, and it'll be a big elaborate story. But he's not, he's not helping me. Right? So I can get tasks done or I can take a minute and just sit there and drink a cup of coffee or something and just, and just be. What we do is, don't you remember? I want you to think about this. That person who says, have you seen my mama lately? Or where's my wife? And the pat answer is, don't you remember that we lost her? We lost her a month ago, or we lost her four years ago. Don't you remember your mama died? Here's what I want you to keep in your mind. If they're asking you about something, then obviously they don't remember it, right? Would they be asking for their deceased loved one if they remember that that person was no longer with us? No, right? Um, did I have lunch? They don't remember having lunch. Feed them again. Not, don't you remember we sat down and we had that chicken salad that you love to have and you've had crackers and then you put some celery and 
you're off on a tangent and they're like, I just, I just want to eat, right? So don't say, don't do you remember? Because if they're asking you about something, then they don't remember it. So how do we answer that when we're communicating with someone? How do we respond to that person who says, have you seen my mama? I haven't seen her lately. That's true. I don't know what your mama's up to. That's true. When are we going to go see my mama? I'm not sure. Let me, let me look at the calendar and see when that might take place. That could be true, right? What I don't want you to do when you're communicating with someone, what we don't encourage you to do is don't um, cause them to re-grieve, especially if maybe they're looking for a deceased child. Because we have older adults and with dementia and Alzheimer's, they start going backwards in time. And maybe they don't remember that they lost a child. And now when we re-remind them, my mother lost a child uh, when she was nine. If my mama ever started talking and asking about Shannon, I'm not going to look at her and go, Mama, don't you remember Shannon died when I was 14? I'm not going to say that because she will re-grieve. Because if she's looking for her, then she's living in that time frame. Right? Is all that making sense to you? I mean, right? It's, it's just, but we don't, and, and that's the hardest thing for professional caregivers to understand. Professional caregivers are some of the worst that will say, I don't know where your mom is. Don't you remember she died? And then they just go, and then they leave that person there. So uh, don't, don't do that. Don't validate a falsehood. Don't validate a lie. If they see pigs running around the floor, don't say, oh, I see him too. Why don't we just go into the other room? I don't want to step in no mess. <laughs> right? But how do we say that? Um, I know you see the pigs. I don't. But why don't we go into the other room and let's find an activity to do? Right? I feel that we can be very evasive with some of our answers um, if the truth is going to hurt them. We're not being malicious. We're not doing it to purposely deceive someone. Their brain is broken. We all told our children that there was a Santa Claus. So we can all say to our older adult, I don't know what your mom is doing, or we'll see her someday, or I'm not, I'm not sure when we're going to go, or why can't I go home? I want to go home. How come I can't go home? Let me go home. I want to go home. What do you want to do at home? Do you want to be at home or do you have something to do there? That's how we answer that question. Not, you can't go home. Or how about, you are home. You are home, honey. Look at this. All this is our home. Right? They don't know that. A lot of times when our older adults are communicating to us and asking to go home, they want that feeling. I grew up on five acres. And when I go in the back door of my parents' home, they still live there, something just comes over me. I just feel calmer and relaxed and happy to be there. That was my childhood experience. I technically think it's because I don't have to clean up anything at that house. So that's why I like going there. I don't have to clean. I don't have to cook. I don't have to fold laundry, uh, vacuum, cut the grass, nothing. So maybe that's why I like going there. But there might be a smell that someone is looking for, and it's just at their home. Could be cookies, it could be mothballs, it could be cows in the back pasture, I don't know. But um, let's ask that question, why do you wanna go home? Do you have something to do, or do you just wanna be there? Because then, either way, you know what's gonna happen. I had a lady one time, and she was talking about, she needed to go home, I need to go home, I need to go home. Why do you need to go home? What do you have to do? I have to get Shannon off the school bus. Well, Shannon was 42 and standing right beside me. But now we knew when Shannon, when she was living, what era in which she was living in. So we couldn't convince her that this adult was Shannon. So we had to put plans in place and make some adjustments so that that relationship could still be a healthy caregiving type relationship and help, help um, Shannon deal with the fact that now her mom has moved on and doesn't remember her as an adult, right? So be really careful. Let's not validate a falsehood uh, like people running around or people standing in the corner talking about them or anything like that. But um, acknowledge that they're scared or that they see that person or that, um, you know, I know you want to go home. 
um, we, what we can't right now, but let's talk about what you want to do when you get there and then get them involved in a task. That is a good rule, uh, a way of redirecting somebody, even with a behavior. With the behavior, we're gonna, we can use that. I've been doing this a long time, a long time, and every day dealing with someone who has dementia or Alzheimer's, you can cry every day or you can laugh every day. Really depends on your perspective. Sometimes a person who you are living with um, will uh, do the funniest thing. My mother, as I said, my dad's a caregiver for my mom, and she was struggling to get something out. And then she just looked at my dad and she said, just shut the baloney. <laughs> and then she dropped her hand and she just started laughing out loud. And I said, that's not what you really wanted to do, was it, Mama? And she was like, no. And she just started. Because her dementia, her word salad, she was mad at my dad. And, but you know what? He knew. He knew what she wanted was him just to get out of the room. Just shut the baloney. And he took off. Yes, honey, I will. And he left. Right? And we laugh about it. We laugh about it today. But you know what? We also cry. Sometimes my mother is just PO'd that she has this. She's just angry that this is her life now. This is not what she planned for. It, this just, she's been robbed. And she, she, that's, not, that's not a lie. That's true. You know? And my father gets mad. As a caregiver, we have the right to be angry. This is not what you signed up for. Nobody got hit 32 and said, Ooh, I hope I'm a caregiver of my mama and daddy with dementia one day. Not one of us, right? If we did, we would have learned about it way back then. We would have planned for it. We just keep our sense of humor about us. Um, and tell a joke, because remember a few minutes ago I said that they're mimicking you, and if you just start laughing, uh, nine times out of ten, they're going to start laughing too. They're not, they're not going to know what they're laughing about, but now we're just all giggling, right? And so, and that's, that works every muscle, and it's a, it takes a little break. Folks with living with get confused with time and place, but does it matter? Does it really matter? We want to keep someone safe. We want to keep them happy and fed. The brain can't keep up with everything. Think about how old you are right now in this room. How old you are. And I use my dad all the time. My dad just turned 83. His brain has not stopped working for 83 years. 24-7 for 83 years. No wonder he forgets sometimes where he puts his keys. No wonder he has to stop a minute before he remembers what else, what else he wanted to write on the grocery store list. And you think about everything your brain does. Your brain is listening to me and processing that and watching me walk back and forth, but you're digesting lunch, right? You are blinking and swallowing. You're fidgeting. All of that stuff and all that's your brain. If you're on medications right now, your brain is breaking down that medication so it gets to where it needs to go. That's your brain. So if we don't remember what day of the week it is, I think that's going to be all right. Right? So as the dementia progresses, the brain gets weaker and weaker and it can't complete tasks. So you might see that person resort, re, blah, 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 blah. Now that was not dementia, that was just tongue tied. <laughs> Thank you very much. But they might start resorting and talking about the past. And if they do, just let it go. The, t the facts of some things just don't matter, All right? Communication dues. And again, well, Mike, I, will, Mike, I will provide these to the library so that it, you can, at a support group, or if you, if you reach out, then we can get those um, to you. But there's a lot of do's, and it's hard to do, but beware of your tone of voice. Be gentle but firm. Give instructions one step at a time. Um, turn on lights before dusk or use night lights, right? What we do is we probably do a lot of don'ts. 
We expect the answer to our questions to be right on point. We know better than that. Right? We get irritated when they ask the same question over and over and over again. Right? I love seeing the shaking heads. I had a son one time. He said, how is it that you're not losing your mind? My mother has asked you the same question 12 times. And all 12 times you have answered the question like it was the very first time she said it. And I said, because in her brain, it was the first time she said it. I can cognitively know that. And I can cognitively keep myself in check, knowing that she thinks it's the first time. And if I look at her and go, you've asked me that, Miss Betty, eight times already, then it's just going to explode, right? Um, ironically, what I did for that lady 12 times, I said she was walking about, she was talking about a walking path. I said, let me show you that walking path. We got up, we walked out to the front porch, we turned around, came back in, I sat her in a different chair. So now she was looking this way instead of looking to, to the right. She's now looking to the left. She didn't ask me that question anymore. Just by getting her up and then bringing her back into the same room, just changing her point of view, her, her visual, stop that process. What we have sometimes with a broken brain is it gets on a mouse wheel, right? And, we, and, and, and this is okay to do. Um, they've asked the same question eight times. When are we leaving? When's the doctor's appointment? You know what? I'm not sure. Let's go to the kitchen and see if we can figure that out. Stop it. Redirect them to something else. Because then when you get in the kitchen, give them something to do. Have them polish the silver. Have them clean out a junk drawer. I had my mom. She gave me 45 minutes a piece uh, because I, she cleaned out a junk drawer at her house. She had eight pizza cutters. They were all the very same kind. The little bitty short ones with a wooden handle that was crooked. I don't know where they got them, and she wouldn't let me throw away seven of them. Or all of the Tupperware lids that didn't have any bowls to go with them. But it's her house, and that's okay. Don't give them too much responsibility. Don't, avoid, uh, don't fuss at them. Don't scold them. Don't try to do it all by yourself. If there is somebody in this room that is caregiving and trying to do it all by yourself, shame on you. It's a hard job. And there is people out there to help you. There are resources out there. There are supports. If you need a break and you don't know how to find a break, let me know. Because there are organizations out there. There are companies out there that will, uh, can help you with a respite stay. And you can have a respite stay and never leave your house, right? We can just have a companion come and take somebody somewhere else to the zoo or whatever and give you a break depending on what your ability is. This is the great little don't do this, but do that piece. Because um, we need reminders sometimes. If you do call here and get some of these pieces, stick them up on cabinet wall doors, right? So that you can see them. Your loved one's not going to know what it is. But then you can catch yourself by um, walking past and opening the glass. And right on the inside is the thing that says, don't expect a right answer to the question. Right? Just give yourself a little break. So behaviors, um, we have to manage ourselves. I've already said they're taking data in visually. So if we're rushed, if we're angry, if we start getting upset, then that's going to do it as well. It takes two to tango and two to tangle. We can redirect to folks if we just do it correctly and we use the right communication techniques. Uh, the, the brain is dying. Dementia means the, the brain is wasting. Alzheimer's, it's, it, the brain is dying. Um, it's not going to get better. We have to adjust ourselves and meet that person where they are. A behavior might very well be an attempt to communicate with you. Are they hungry? Do they have to go to the bathroom? Are they in pain? Is the tag in their shirt itching at them, right? What's happening? I had a gentleman one time, he kept saying his shoes were too small. They kept getting in bigger shoes. His shoes weren't too small. His toenails need to be cut, right? Don't listen. Listen with the whole part of you. But he was getting aggressive and having um, temper tantrums and things like that because he was trying to tell us that something was wrong about with his feet. This is some of your um, behaviors. Um, you know, I, I'm not a big statistic girl, um, but I, I do put it on here. But if somebody's hitting you, it really doesn't matter that this slide says it's 32% of the time, right? Because it's 100% of the time in your house. How do we fix that? 
how do we redirect from that? And there are, there are uh, techniques out there to help with that. When someone does exhibit a behavior, they are throwing that chicken across the room. What happened before that? Or if they're yelling at you, what happened before? What was going on? What room were they in? What were you trying to communicate with them? A lot of times, the explosion is because they're not getting it, and it's just as frustrating. And we have to be the one to recognize, you know what, this is not working. I need to do something a little bit different, and I need to figure out what caused this. And then how did you handle it once everything squashes? You know, and really having that retrospective part to go, ooh, I could do it better next time if I remember that. But how do we recognize that person's behaviors? You know, watch their body language, their eyes, their facial expressions. Are they constantly moving, rocking back and forth? You know, think about our children, five years old. When do they have to go to the bathroom? When they're rocking back and forth and swishing their hips back and forth. We learn that as a parent, we can learn that as a caregiver. What we can also learn is what our loved ones, um, how our loved one's body works, right? When they start having incontinent episodes, when is that happening? Is it two hours after lunch or 45 minutes after lunch? If we can be aware of that time, then we can make ourselves a note and turn on our little stopwatch. And when it goes off, you, need, you know you need to take your loved one to the bathroom. Right, because we've learned how their system works. The system doesn't change. What changes is the, the, the brain's ability to recognize that it has to go to the bathroom, because the brain is dying, and the brain can't do everything. Lots of behaviors. We know wandering. Wandering is one of the uh, prime um, behaviors associated with Alzheimer's type dementia. And we wander because when do we learn to open a door? When we're two, three, you hand your kids some groceries and say, help mama out, but open the door or get the door for mama because my hands are full and they're so proud. That's a long-term memory. They're 86 and they remember how to open a door because they'd learned it when they were three. They see a door, they see a coat on a coat rack and they're gonna go. We have to make changes if we have that diagnosis. Hallucinations are sensory. Someone might be smelling smoke. How do we respond to that? There's nothing on fire in this house. You're just smelling things. You know what? I don't, I don't smell what you smell. Well, why don't we go walk around the house and figure it out? Number one, it's exercise. Number two, it gets their mind on something else. Number three, no telling what you might find. You might find the keys that you lost earlier in the day, right? Uh, hearing things, seeing things, uh, paranoia, you've stolen, you're taking all my money, you're cheating on me, you're, the kids are trying to get the house, all of this stuff. There's a wonderful piece that um, uh, the Alzheimer's Federation of America has. It's called, you say, they say, you say. If they're accusing you of stealing their belongings, this is what you say. It's like a script. You don't even have to think about it. Uh, you can just read it off. Um, and I can get that piece. I can get that piece to you as well because it saved a lot of arguments because they say, you're just trying to take everything. No, I'm not trying to take everything you got. Uh, you're just trying to take everything. I've already got everything. I don't need nothing else from you. Let's go to the, let's go to get in the car, right? Let's, you know, or I know you think that's happening, but you know, uh, let's go figure out what I can have and what you want to keep, right? Let's just divert the conversation. Eating problems, sexual misconduct, there are five, uh, four areas on our body that maintain sensation as dementia progresses. The tips of our fingers, our lips, the bottom of our feet, and our genitalia. That doesn't lose sensation. Somebody can't feel this on the arm, but they feel it on the finger. That's why if you think about the people that you know, are they scratching? Are they walking around and picking up things? They're trying to figure out what it is, so I'm just going to pick it up and touch it, right? Or you might have someone who's eating everything because they can feel that. You know that they're feeling something on the bottom of their feet because they're shuffling. 
right? But they're afraid they're going to step on something, so they don't pick up their foot. If I never pick up my foot, I will never step on anything. Very, very smart, actually. It's very low percentage of sexual inappropriateness. Um, if that is someone in the room that's dealing with that, I'd be happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one after this class is over. Uh, it's, it, it, is, it is very um, low percentage of the time, um, and there are certain ways to redirect from that. Shadowing, has anybody in the room been shadowed? They just follow you everywhere you want, everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. That can get on your nerves, but you know what I think? I think that that person knows you love them. I think that person knows that you will not let anything happen to them. I think that person knows that when the going gets rough, you've got them. There's nothing that can happen because you're right there with them. And if you don't know, if I don't know where you are, then you might not know where I am. And I need you to know where I am because what if something happens? You're my safety net, right? But you need to go to the bathroom all by yourself, right? So men like to hold purses. Find your purse. If you're, if you're caring for a man, then you, I mean, look, my husband holds my purse right now and I'm 57. I know my dad, when he was 57, was holding my mama's purse. My, you know, he holds my purse, like I said, now. If I go into the dressing room, hold my purse, I'm going to go try this on. I don't know why it is. Why is it that we don't want to take our purses into the dressing room? When you have a, but I have a husband there, he can do something. So, um, so give your husband something or give your, the man something to hold. Open up the cookbook and say, don't lose my place. Can you hold my place? I'll be right back. Go to the bathroom. The brain can't do a lot of things at one time. That purse is going to stand there and make sure that they don't lose their space. Right? And then when they come out, when you come out, thank you so much. That was such a big help for me. Look, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't wrinkle a page. I appreciate that. Now let's go bake. Try that for, for, for a man if they're following you. And you can do the same thing for women. They're not going to hold their purse while a man goes to the bathroom. But give them a magazine. Give them a pot. Give them a bowl. Give them some spices. Give them a can of tomatoes and a can opener. I don't want to forget to do this, honey, so can you hold this for me? And she'll stand right there while he goes and takes care of whatever he needs to take care of. So that's why that shadowing, why I, and if you think about it that way, then maybe it's not so bad if when they're traveling behind you, if you think it's because he or she knows that they're safe with me. They're safe with me. And maybe it makes it a little bit um, easier to, to handle that shadowing, right? Um, they don't want to shower. They don't want to take a, take, a, take a bath, change their clothes. That is the most common complaint I hear from families. And this is what I suggest that you do for this. Go turn the shower on and then find your person. I turned the shower on for you. Well, why did you do that? Because you asked me to. They're not going to know that they didn't ask you. They have short-term memory. <laughs> they're not going to know, and they're not going to want to look like they don't know what they're talking about, so they're not going to say to you, I didn't do this, because they very well might have. Start the water. Tell them that you wanted them to do it. Uh, because what they're going to say is, I just took a bath. In their mind's eye, they did just take a bath. Because they took one two weeks ago, but they, there's no time. There's no date. We've already seen that slide, right? So turn on the, don't, don't try it, just go turn on the water. Your shower's ready. And see if that doesn't work. You could do that with food. You could do that with laying out clothes. Just do it. But just, just do some things and then say, it's just because you wanted me to. Why are we getting in the car? We, you said you want to take a ride, right? Sometimes less is more. And you know what? If you bring a caregiver into the home to deal with some of these behaviors, they're not coming in to help him or her. They're coming in to help you. So how do you introduce care in the home when your loved one doesn't want it? Bobby, they're not coming in here for you. They're coming in for me. I need the help. And is that not true? You need some time off. They're not coming there. Hire that person. Get them in. Have them come in a few days while you're there. And then look and go, I'm gonna, I need to run to the store, but, but um, Susie Q's here. 
And that person will go, I'll be fine. Just go, just go. Because now they're used to that person being in the home. What happens a lot of times is we hire care. They show up. Honey, here's Susie Q. Susie Q, here's honey, and I'm out of here. There's no transition in there, right? We just have to change the way we do things. And we can, we can, we can adjust if we just think about it a second. If we just think, uh, okay, hold on. What am I trying to accomplish? And there's a lot that goes on with being a caregiver. And, and, um, and I don't know, your, everybody's journey is different. You might be listening to everything I said and think, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And I, that might be true in your situation. Um, but we just cognitively have to remember that you have the ability to adjust. If you're wanting your loved one with a dementia diagnosis to adjust or an Alzheimer's, it's not going to happen. And we need to um, make new memories now. Because when our journey is over, being a caregiver, all we're going to have are the memories that we've made during this journey. And what are we going to remember? The fried chicken flying across the room or the fact that my mom wanted her, my dad to shut the baloney, right? What, what, what am I going to take with me when my mom's journey is over with? There are certain activities. The library's got wonderful memory bags. You can try activities out before you go to the expense. This is my contact information right here. You can email me directly. I can send you five pages of activities. And some of them might work. And some, just like cleaning out the rummage drawer, men like to clean out things. Give them toolboxes, no, or fishing tackle boxes, no hooks. That's not what you call them. You don't call them a hook. Yeah, you do call it a hook, don't you? Yeah, fishing, it's a hook, yeah. Um, um, or sort buttons or something like that. But, um, and then it's, um, honey, can you help me? That's how you communicate that to get them to do something. Especially if we're, a, if we're a woman in the room and we need to redirect our, our spouse. Men want to be needed. They want to be successful. They want to know that they're still taking care of the family. I can't do this, honey. Will you please help me? And give them something to do. They just want to help. And then the busier they are, then the better that everybody sleeps, the better everybody eats. And... And there you go. I mean, it, you, you'll have a memory of eight pizza cutters to keep with you at the end of your, your journey, whatever your memory is. But make those and encourage other family members to make these memories now, too, because um, you don't want to be left with all the negative of all the hard parts of caregiving. Let's try to remember the fun, the fun parts and how we still made a connection as husband and wife, our mother and daughter, our sisters or whatever.